What happens when a notorious biker gang's criminal activities finally catch up to them? Hells Angels biker gang member Adam Lee Hall has been found guilty of three men from Pittsfield. From drug trafficking to extortion and even murder, the reign of crime by this Hells Angels club has left a trail of chaos and fear. The Hells Angels don't have to actively recruit members. They want people that bring them value. But now, we'll witness a pivotal moment in their lives when the Book of Records finally opens to 10 members in the courtroom. How will these hardened individuals react when faced with the consequences of their actions? Let's find out. The Hells Angels Club. The Hells Angels, a motorcycle club founded in California in 1948, is perhaps the most famous of the outlaw motorcycle gangs. Most Hells Angels members are white males who ride Harley Davidson motorcycles. Each member is known by an official name, often a colorful nickname. Membership in the club is tightly controlled, with prospective members undergoing a thorough vetting and initiation process. If someone decides to leave the club, they must surrender all items displaying the Hells Angels name or Death Head insignia. While some chapters have clubhouses, Members typically gather in bars and embark on rides together to recreational destinations. The Hells Angels Motorcycle Club was established in Fontana, California, near San Bernardino, in 1948. The name Hells Angels had previously been used as a nickname by World War II bomber crews and as the title of a Hollywood film in 1930. The club expanded its presence with chapters in San Francisco and Oakland in 1954 and 1957, respectively, and later internationally into New Zealand in 1961. However, it wasn't until 1965 when Thomas Connor Lynch, the Attorney General of California, released a report on motorcycle gangs, including the Hells Angels and their criminal activities, that the club gained significant public attention. Hunter Thompson's book, Hells Angels, A Strange and Terrible Saga, further contributed to their notoriety. Thompson had initially befriended many members, but eventually fell out of favor with the club and was physically assaulted by them. Ralph, Sonny Barger, president of the Oakland chapter, became a prominent figure for the Hells Angels due to Thompson's qualified admiration. The Hells Angels' reputation grew after they were hired as stage security for the Altamont Festival, a Rolling Stones concert in 1969. Unfortunately, a Hells Angels member was charged with murder in the stabbing death of a concert goer, but was later acquitted. This incident, along with the violence captured in the documentary Gimme Shelter, added to their infamy. In the world of cinema, low-budget filmmakers capitalized on the public's fascination with bikers by producing several biker movies that referenced the Hells Angels in their titles. Law enforcement officials began associating the Hells Angels not only with barroom fights, but also with the production and distribution of illegal drugs, particularly methamphetamine. Attempts to prosecute club members under the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act in the early 1980s ended in mistrials. However, the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation continues to classify the Hells Angels as an outlaw motorcycle gang in its national gang report. This was further proven by the series of arrests and sentencing faced by their members. You won't believe the gravity of the crimes they committed hiding under the umbrella of their fraternity. These are Hell's Angels members reacting to life sentence. Adam Lee Hall. He was the first member of the Hell's Angels fraternity to come headlong with the furious arm of the law. Adam Lee Hall, a resident of Peru, Massachusetts, was delivered a devastating blow as a Hampton Superior Court jury in February 2014 pronounced him guilty on three counts of murder, as well as charges of kidnapping and witness intimidation. The solemn moment was marked by Hall bowing his head, while the families of the victims and law enforcement officers found solace in each other's embrace. Alongside two accomplices, Hall was accused of the August 2011 shootings of David Glasser, Edward Frampton, and Robert Chadwell, followed by the disposal of their bodies in Beckett. This trial marked the first chapter in the legal proceedings against Hall. After a separate trial for each defendant, Adam was found guilty by the jury. The judge then sentenced him to three consecutive life terms, 
along with additional sentences for armed robbery and kidnapping. The judge made it clear that Adam's actions showed extreme depravity and a complete lack of respect for human dignity. Throughout the trial, it was evident that Hall specifically targeted Glasser because of his mental disability, taking advantage of his vulnerability. The families of the victims expressed their belief that Hall deserved the harsh punishment he received. Interestingly, during the trial and sentencing, Hall showed no signs of remorse. Carol Chadwell Smith, Robert Chadwell's sister, expressed relief that the trial had concluded after a long and difficult two years. Hall's defense lawyer, Alan Black, did not immediately comment after the verdict and stated that there was no physical evidence linking Hall to the killings. District Attorney David Capeless commended the extensive and tireless efforts of the investigative team. He mentioned that the investigation went beyond determining Hall's involvement to explore the possibility of anyone else being responsible for the crimes. To confirm this heinous claim during the trial, two of Hall's co-defendants testified that he orchestrated the killings, while another individual charged as an accessory claimed he assisted in disposing of the bodies out of fear of Hall. These co-defendants will be tried separately later in the year. It's a tragic and disturbing case that highlights the brutality and disregard for human life displayed by Adam Lee Hall and his accomplices. The justice system has ensured that he will spend the rest of his life behind bars with no possibility of parole. Brian Shane Henson Brian Shane Henson, a 40-year-old member of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club from Merced, was sentenced by United States District Judge Jesus Gilberto Bernal. Henson was a prospective member of the Merced chapter of the Hells Angels when he engaged in a drug and firearms deal with an undercover agent from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, ATF. Court documents reveal that in early 2017, Henson negotiated a deal to sell one pound of methamphetamine and four ounces of marijuana in exchange for 20 stolen firearms. On January 25th, 2017, Henson and his co-defendant, Hussein Fawas Eltareb, who was a full-patch member of the Hells Angels, traveled from Merced to Needles, California to meet the undercover agent. Upon arriving in Needles, Henson provided the undercover agent with the drugs while taking possession of the 20 firearms, which he placed in the trunk of Eltareb's car. Immediately after the exchange, law enforcement officers arrested Henson and Eltareb. During the arrest, a loaded .38 caliber revolver was recovered from Eltareb's vehicle, concealed next to the driver's seat. Henson pleaded guilty in October to charges of distributing methamphetamine and possessing firearms in furtherance of a drug trafficking crime. He was sentenced to the mandatory minimum of 180 months in federal custody. Eltareb, on the other hand, opted for a bench trial in December. Judge Bernal found him guilty of conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine, distribution of methamphetamine, and possession of a firearm in furtherance of a drug trafficking crime. Eltareb is scheduled to be sentenced on May 21st and will also face a mandatory minimum sentence of 180 months in federal prison. Emily Martin This 61-year-old Emery Pitt Martin from St. Anne de Madawaska has been sentenced to seven and a half years in prison for pleading guilty to cocaine trafficking and acting for the benefit of a criminal organization. This information comes from Radio Canada. Martin appeared in court via video conference due to possible COVID-19 symptoms. Martin has been identified by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police RCMP as a longtime member of the Hells Angels. The Crown and Defence initially sought an eight-year prison sentence, but Judge Denise LeBlanc decided to reduce it because Martin had already spent 1,209 days in prison since his arrest in 2018. During his time in prison, Martin was held in solitary confinement for extended periods and had his privacy invaded by a surveillance camera in his cell. The exact duration of his solitary confinement at the Dalhousie Regional Correctional Centre was not specified in court. Additionally, his upcoming imprisonment was reduced by approximately five years, with each day spent in prison before the trial credited as 1.5 days. Martin's case is related to Operation J Thunder, an RCMP investigation targeting cocaine sales in several areas of northern New Brunswick. He is believed to be primarily responsible for importing drugs into the northwestern part of the province 
due to his close ties with the Hells Angels. None of the others who were charged in the operation are members of the Hells Angels. According to the RCMP's estimation, Martin imported at least 96 kilograms of cocaine between the summers of 2016 and 2017. Martin admitted to being a member of the Montreal chapter before switching to the New Brunswick Nomad chapter in November 2016. In October 2021, Martin was sentenced for his involvement in a significant inter-provincial narcotics ring. He was described as a senior executive of the organization. Martin's status as a member of the NB Hells Angels Nomad chapter granted him the power to direct trafficking in the territory he controlled. Before the trial, Martin was scheduled for a four-month trial, but reached a plea deal instead. He pleaded guilty to two of the five charges against him, conspiracy to traffic and committing a crime for the benefit of a criminal organization. Martin facilitated the drug trade between the supplier in Quebec and a group of New Brunswick traffickers. He allowed them to sell in northeastern New Brunswick in exchange for a portion of their sales. Neil Cantrell Neil Cantrell, a longtime biker and leader of a 2016 extortion plot, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for kidnapping and assaulting a former associate who no longer wanted to grow illegal marijuana. Justice Ward Branch of the Supreme Court of British Columbia acknowledged that Cantrell, who was 62 years old at the time, was the mastermind behind the extortion scheme and deserved a longer sentence than his co-accused, his son Stephen, 38, and fellow Hells Angel Robert Lowry, 49. The three men were convicted in 2020 on charges of kidnapping, extortion, aggravated assault, and overcoming resistance. The victim, Robert Houle, had been growing cannabis for Cantrell for over 12 years. In December 2014, Houle expressed his desire to exit the illegal marijuana business and offered the growing equipment to Cantrell. However, he heard nothing from Cantrell until July 2016, when Cantrell contacted him to arrange a meeting. The following day, Houle was abducted, choked, and beaten at a roadside pullout near Hope. He was then taken to his house, where the trio attempted to coerce him into signing over his property. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police RCMP intervened, and Houle was taken to the hospital for his injuries, which included cuts, broken bones, and a burn on his forehead. The assault had a severe impact on Houle, forcing him to enter the witness protection program. Justice Branch noted that during the attack, Houle feared for his life and believed he was going to die. The judge cited a report filed during the sentencing hearing, which revealed Cantrell's lack of remorse for his actions. Cantrell justified his behavior by claiming that he was owed money and that Houle should have anticipated the consequences. Cantrell showed no expression of remorse during the proceedings. Lowry, who had a previous history as a successful businessman, received a nine-year prison sentence for his role as the muscle in the extortion scheme. Stefan, Cantrell's son, was sentenced to six years in prison. Stefan had limited involvement in the violence but played a part in executing the extortion plan. He had strong support from the community with family, friends, and employers expressing surprise at his involvement in such a crime. Subscribers pick. Inside the dimly lit courtroom, this notorious gangster stood before the judge, his body painted like a vampire. As we explore the stories of Hell's Angels members reacting to life sentence, this particular case stands out due to the brutality of the crime comtited. People whispered as the judge pronounced the verdict, life behind bars. The gangster's eyes showed insolence but quickly softened, revealing a mix of emotions. A faint smile appeared on his lips, a sign of something unexpected beneath his tough physique. At that moment, it became clear that the Hell's Angel's spirit would not be easily broken, even in prison. The gangster had faced battles on the streets, hiding under the club, and now he's set to face the reality of life imprisonment. As he was taken away, the paintings and irritating drawings on his body left a haunting impression. Truly, legends of the Hell's Angels have wild adventures that will never be erased from the minds of people, especially relatives of their victims. As we unveil the dark side of this brotherhood, what's your thoughts about their cruel expeditions, and do you think they deserve their fate? Please, 
We would like you to share your thoughts in the comment section, and let's keep these revelations interesting. David Giles David Giles, a longtime member of the Hells Angels biker gang, got a sentence of 18 years in prison for his involvement in a conspiracy to smuggle half a ton of cocaine into British Columbia. This is the longest sentence ever given to a member of the gang in the province. Giles, who is 66 years old and in poor health, listened as the judge read out the sentence. The judge considered the nature of the crime, the large number of drugs involved, the intention for it to be an ongoing operation, Giles's role, and his circumstances in determining the sentence. Giles received credit for the time he had already spent in pretrial custody, resulting in a net jail term of 11 years and one month. He and his associate, Kevin Van Kalkeren, brokered a smuggling deal in 2012 with undercover police officers posing as South American drug lords. Van Kalkeren pleaded guilty and received a 16-year sentence. The drug shipment, consisting of 200 kilograms of cocaine, was delivered to a warehouse in Burnaby, where Giles and Van Kalkeren were arrested along with six others. Giles's lawyer argued for a lower sentence, citing his client's critical illness and the need for a liver transplant. The defense also claimed that Van Kalkeren was the real leader of the conspiracy. However, the judge rejected these arguments, stating that once Giles was recruited into the conspiracy, he acted as an equal partner to Van Kalkeren. Giles had expressed his target of transporting 500 kilograms of cocaine every three months and was actively involved in planning the distribution of the drugs. Giles had a difficult upbringing and a history of criminal activity with his last conviction dating back to 1984. Before this case, the longest sentence given to Hell's Angels members in British Columbia was 15 years for manslaughter in a beating death. Another individual, Sean Womax, who helped unload the cocaine, was also sentenced. Womax received a six-year sentence for possession for trafficking. The judge took into account his role as hired labor and his struggles with addiction, noting his expressions of remorse and the influence of his addiction on his criminal history. Norman Cox and Robert Leonard Thomas Norman Cox and Robert Leonard Thomas, both full-patch members of the Kilwana Hells Angels, were involved in a tragic incident in June 2011 that resulted in the death of Dane Phillips. Phillips a 51-year-old man was attempting to peacefully resolve a conflict between his two sons and two teenagers associated with the Hells Angels Biker Club. Unfortunately, Phillips's son witnessed the brutal assault as Cox and Thomas attacked his father with a baseball bat and a hammer. The prosecution argued that one of the accused Hells Angels participated in the attack due to his gang connections. Crown counsel Joe Bello highlighted the anger directed towards Phillips by the accused before the attack. Both Cox and Thomas were ultimately sentenced to 15 years in prison for taking Phillips's life, but their sentence was reduced to 12 years after receiving credit for pre-sentence custody. The Associate Chief Justice of the BC Supreme Court described the attack as brutal and determined, involving weapons against an unarmed man who was simply trying to resolve a dispute. In her victim impact statement, Phillips's wife, Janine, expressed the profound loss and void left in their family by the warm-hearted presence of her husband, stating that his violent and unrecognizable death had caused her to suffer a heart attack. She emphasized the senselessness of the crime and how the perpetrators had become involved in their lives. The confrontation occurred on a public highway outside Kilwana, where Thomas brandished a baseball bat and a ball-peen hammer, repeatedly berating Phillips for crossing paths with the Hells Angels. Other Hell's Angels associates allegedly kicked Phillips while he was on the ground following the assault by Cox and Thomas. The sentencing was acknowledged by the Kelowna RCMP superintendent, who expressed hope that the guilty pleas would bring some closure to those who cared for Dane Phillips, while noting that the matter remained before the courts. Zane Powera Wallace A court drama ensued after the sentencing of a Hell's Angels gang prospect named Zane Powera Wallace. This guy was responsible for carrying out a brutal assault that tragically led to the death of a mother of two, Jasmine Wilson. So Wallace appeared before Justice Francis Cook in the High Court at Wanganui to receive his sentence. He faced multiple charges, including the murder of Jasmine Wilson. 
The incident occurred back in 2019 when Wallace dumped Wilson's unconscious and badly injured body at the Wanganui Hospital's emergency department. Her injuries were so severe that she eventually passed away in Wellington Hospital. Now, things got tense in the courtroom because emotions were running high between Wallace's and Wilson's families. Extra security had to be present to keep them separated in the packed public gallery. When Wallace, wearing a white t-shirt, was brought into the courtroom, loud sobbing filled the room. The tension between the families erupted when Justice Cook sentenced Wallace to life imprisonment with a minimum non-parole period of 15 years and 6 months. Insults were hurled, threats were made, and things got so heated that the police and court security had to step in to prevent any physical violence. Eventually, the courtroom had to be cleared. Before the sentencing, Brenda O'Shea, Wilson's mother, expressed her deep anger and grief in her victim impact statement. She described how her relationship with her husband and other children had been fractured by the murder of her daughter. The ongoing trial had prevented them from mourning together and finding closure. O'Shea spoke lovingly about her daughter, highlighting her creativity, talent, and warm personality. She emphasized the impact of losing Wilson and the never-ending guilt she felt every day for not being able to protect her. Robert, Wilson's husband, shared the heart-wrenching experience of having to tell their boys that their mother might not survive, and if she did, she would never be the same again. Wilson's sisters also spoke about the trauma they endured and how they wanted to send a message that violence against women is never acceptable. During the proceedings, Crown Prosecutor Chris Wilkinson-Smith argued for a longer, minimum, non-parole period, considering the extreme violence and threats Wallace had inflicted on Wilson and her family. Wallace's defense lawyer, Debbie Goodlett, acknowledged that he would either spend his life in jail or on parole, and expressed his desire to address his problems through treatment and counseling. In the end, Justice Cook emphasized the seriousness of Wallace's actions and the need for a substantial prison sentence. He described the sustained period of terror that Wilson endured before her tragic death, including threats to kill her in explicit and gruesome ways. Dean Daniel Kelsey Back in October of the year 2000, Kelsey assaulted an innocent man named Sean Simmons in Dartmouth. Simmons was a 31-year-old father of two from Lower Sackville. The assault took place in the lobby of an apartment building on Trinity Avenue. Kelsey, along with three other individuals, was charged for Simmons' death. In March 2003, he received a life sentence for his crimes. Two other men, Neil William Smith and Wayne Alexander James, are also serving life sentences for their roles in Simmons's murder. A fourth man, Stephen Garreau, was released in 2018 after the prosecution against him was ended by a judge. The victim, Simmons, was killed on the orders of a Hells Angels member due to allegations of an affair with the gang member's wife. Initially, Kelsey was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and first-degree murder. However, his sentence was later increased in 2008 and then again in 2015 due to assaults on fellow inmates. Eventually, his conviction was overturned on appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada substituted a conviction for second-degree murder. This revised Kelsey's parole eligibility dates, making him eligible for full parole in July 2019. At his parole hearing, the board acknowledges that Kelsey has apologized for his actions demonstrating an evolution in his attitude and an understanding of the consequences. A mental health progress report indicates that he has maintained a desire to behave well and work on himself throughout his sentence, despite the challenges he has faced. Upon his release from a medium security institution after 20 years of incarceration, Kelsey will need time to adjust. For the first three months of his parole, he must return to the halfway house every night. Kelsey is subject to special conditions aimed at ensuring his risk factors are addressed and community safety is maintained. These conditions include abstaining from drugs and alcohol, continuing psychological counseling, avoiding association with anyone involved in criminal activity, and having no contact with any member of the victim's family. Overall, Kelsey is considered to have a moderate high risk of violently reoffending in the medium and long term. However, while under supervised release like day parole, 
his psychologist assesses his risk level as moderate in the short term. Kelsey's level of accountability and motivation is rated as high, while his potential for social reintegration is considered moderate. During his time in prison, Kelsey has been involved in conflicts and acts of violence, accumulating 20 disciplinary offenses, including fighting, making threats, and failing drug tests. However, he has not been involved in any violent incidents since August 2019. There have also been instances of misconduct, such as substance use and disrespect. The most recent incident occurred in May, when Kelsey displayed an inappropriate attitude and used vulgar language toward correctional officers during a search. In considering its decision, the parole board reviewed Kelsey's file, assessed his risk factors, examined his indigenous social history, ISH, and considered written submissions from Kelsey and Simmons's family. It was noted that Kelsey's grandmother is Metis, and his maternal grandfather is Mi'kmaq, but Kelsey had limited exposure to his Metis culture, spirituality, and language, except during his time in prison. His family has experienced substance abuse, gambling issues, and instances of sexual abuse. Steven Sanders, this former leader of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club in San Diego, named Steven Sanders, who's 44 years old, got slapped with a hefty prison sentence. The district attorney, Bonnie Dumanis, announced on Friday that Sanders will spend the next 25 years behind bars. Sanders, who used to be the president of the San Diego chapter of the Hells Angels, has admitted to kidnapping two people for the benefit of a criminal street gang. He has been involved in a series of criminal cases over the past few months, including a conviction in July 2012 for robbery and assault. In March 2012, Sanders was found guilty of solicitation to commit murder. Prosecutors claim that he tried to have witnesses and investigators killed in connection with a pending kidnapping and torture case against him. In April, he pleaded guilty to charges of assault with a deadly weapon related to a violent attack on partygoers in Pacific Beach. Then, in June, Sanders pleaded guilty to felony kidnapping and committing crimes for the benefit of a criminal street gang. During his sentencing on Thursday, Sanders spoke in court and said that he felt pressured to plead guilty because he faced a lengthy sentence if he were to be convicted at trial. Despite admitting to his crimes, Sanders insists that he never admitted that the Hells Angels were a criminal street gang. His attorney attempted to withdraw his guilty plea, claiming new witness testimony, but the judge rejected the motion. The district attorney's office and the Drug Enforcement Administration worked together on Sanders' case. Dumanis sees Sanders' sentencing as a significant victory for law enforcement. She stated that in recent years, Sanders had engaged in a series of violent crimes against the citizens of San Diego. During his prosecution for the kidnapping and mayhem case, he conspired to murder those who played key roles in the case against him. Dumanis emphasized that their office thwarted his plans and held him accountable for his actions. Christian Rufino Christian Rufino, a member of the Hells Angel Motorcycle Club, was arrested by Cranston police for carrying a firearm as a felon. This happened in December 2009 when he was 40 years old. In August 2011, Rufino pleaded guilty to being a felon in possession of a firearm. The charges stemmed from a traffic stop in December 2009 conducted by a Cranston police officer who noticed that Rufino appeared to be under the influence. During a search of Rufino's vehicle, the officer found a loaded handgun, ammunition, and an illegal substance in a small bag. Rufino had prior convictions, including assault and battery with a dangerous weapon in 1995, armed robbery with intent to cause harm in New Bedford in 1998, and a bank robbery involving force, violence, and intimidation in Maine in 1990. The Cranston police, along with officers from the FBI's Safe Street Task Force, investigated his case. During the sentencing hearing, U.S. District Court Judge John McConnell categorized Rufino as an armed career criminal. Prosecutors revealed that Rufino admitted to being a member of the New York chapter of the Hells Angels. As a result, Rufino received a 15-year prison sentence for violating the law that prohibits felons from carrying firearms. It was also disclosed that Rufino was initially pulled over for speeding on Route 95, indicating his disregard for traffic rules. Due to his actions, Rufino found himself back in jail 
this time for a much longer duration. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.